Thank you. My name is Mike Purgatory. Um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about programming. Uh, this isn't going to be a very technical talk. Instead, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of programming. A lot of that history follows along the history of computing, but not entirely. Um, I'm going to talk about what makes modern languages distinct. And hopefully the additional content, uh, context will help you guys out, um, even in a technical sense. Um, I, I always feel like having a little bit of background in things uh, to help make sense of what I'm doing helps me with the, the tasks as I go. A lot of this is going to be uh, familiar to you, but I'm not going to take any of your knowledge for granted. So uh, let's, uh, let's get going with a little bit of history on programming. Um, programming kind of starts around 8, 850 um, in what we would call today Baghdad. I'm not sure if it was had the same name back then, but um, the Banu Musa brothers um, published a book called The Book of Ingenious Devices. Um, the book mainly consisted of diagrams of about 100 machines that were called automata, um, basically uh, automatic machines that performed a function uh, according to pre-written instruction. But there was one machine that kind of stood out in this book. It was called the automatic flute. And what made it different was that it was programmable. Um, it was able to produce sound through steam, and it had two-way and three-way valves, or one and two-way valves, I'm sorry, um, that could be changed. And this, um, a lot of people think, is the first um, instance of someone programming a, a machine. Um, we're going to jump ahead a little bit, about a thousand years. <laughs> That's quite a, quite a ways, I know, but... Um, the Jockard loom, um, Joseph Marie Jockard, I hope I'm saying that right, um, develop a device uh, to attach to looms. Uh, a loom, if, if you're not sure, is a device that weaves textiles and tapestries and fabrics. Um, they're still in use today, but obviously a lot more automated. But he developed a device that could be attached on top and could be fed punch cards that would um, make the weaving of more intricate fabrics and designs um, a lot more possible. Each card correspond to a single row of design. Um, also, around that same time, we had, oops, excuse me, we had the auto piano players that kind of operate in a similar manner. They used cards or this, this paper. We've all kind of seen these in these old-timey Western movies, but um, those were, in a sense, using a, an, an early form of punch cards. Uh, jump to 1830s, probably a lot of you guys have heard of Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace. Um, Charles Babbage uh, developed a device he called the analytic engine, um, basically was a mechanical uh, computer. Um, this also used punch cards. Um, the computer had, uh, used uh, things such as sequential control, branching, looping. Um, it was said to be Turing complete which means that it could uh, simulate a single tape Turing machine. It was essentially a computer. Um, but the more relevant to what we're talking about was uh, Ada Lovelace and her algorithm she wrote to calculate Bernoulli numbers on the device. Um, this is widely considered as the first complex program. Um, of course, as you just saw, there was programming before, but this is the, this is the what is considered the first um, complex program. Uh, there's some debate on how much of it is actually from Ada Lovelace. Don't want to get too much into it, but uh, she, is, she is credited as being the, the first computer programmer. Um, and then we go into the late 1800s. Uh, Herman Hollerith um, started a company called the Tabulating Machine Company, which would later become IBM through various mergers and acquisitions. But uh, he, again, used punch cards. Uh, his machine developed, was developed to track census data. Uh, before that, it was all done by hand. There was a lot of errors. It wasn't very efficient. Um, here's an example of his, uh, one of the cards that might be used for his machine. Uh, the machine was also used for things like employee timekeeping, uh, scales, using weighing scales, and automatic meat slicers. I so. also kind of love how like, all the old-timey computer uh, companies, like had very literal names, tabulating machine company. Now we have like Uber, which doesn't mean anything, but I hope one day maybe they go back to that. Um, okay, so 1940s, we're into the uh, 
the electronic computer age. And this is ENIAC, um, considered the first electronic computer. Um, ENIAC was developed to calculate artillery firing tables. Um, it really was just a collection of other machines, each machine being, uh, they, they would call each machine a function table, and really each of these sort of submachines just, just calculate one function. So kind of how we, you know, write a function. <laughs> there was like a whole machine doing just that, and they were interconnected um, that would give them more complexity. But what was interesting, now we're getting into um, programming that is not uh, punch cards or um, actually ENIAC was programmed in a way that much more resembled opening and closing of valves. Um, it had each machine, each of those um, function tables had 1,200 10-way switches, and it took weeks for the programmers to diagram these things out. Um, it then took days to get all the switches and cables into place. And then, so once you had this set up, um, obviously this is one program, and you're, they, they ran as many, um, as many tests on this one program as they possibly could before they had to change it again for obvious reasons. Uh, to debug the thing, it was a very physical process. You had to literally, they had to climb into these machines, uh, kind of reconnect loose cables or make sure switches were in place. Um, thank God. We're beyond that. Um, so now we're in the electronic computer age, and we get into um, something that resembles more of what we know as programming. Um, we again, we've talked about machine code in assembly language. Um, machine code is basically just instruction that's executed directly by a computer central processing unit. Um, nobody writes in it anymore. I, again, for very obvious reasons, um, it was very difficult. Um, it, uh, it's been said that looking at machine code is vaguely comparable to looking at DNA, uh, DNA molecule, mo atom by atom. And the U.S. Copyright Office, you can, you can copyright, copyright register a computer program, but they can't copyright anything written in machine code because it's so complex they can't determine if it's original or not. Um, so we had to find a better way and we did a little bit with assembly language. Um, there's a very, assembly language has a very strong correlation to meet, uh, machine code, almost one-to-one. -one. Um, it is still very low level. Um, the thing about assembly language is that it was not, a language had to be devised for each computer architecture. It wasn't just like one language that could move from computer system to computer system. Um, and what it does is it uses mnemonic uh, representation uh, to stand in for uh, machine instructions. So um, it, wasn't, it wasn't hiding much abstraction. You, you could have a thing like move that would be used to represent moving uh, bits to different registers. So, um, and both of these incidentally say, hello world. Interesting. Um, so then we get into high level um, programming. Um, high level, what it means to be high level is uh, abstraction from detail. And the more abstraction a language is from machine code, the more high level it is said to be. Um, high, uh, high level programming um, is, uh, it, it favors usability over optimal efficiency. So where assembly language or machine code is written to be very efficient, high level programming's main purpose is just to be usable. Um, there's interpreted and compiled. Uh, interpreted uh, uses an interpreter to interpret syntax, uh, which is then executed in machine code. And then compiled uh, is a language that is compiled directly down to machine code. Now, a compiled language can then also have an intermediary, intermediary step where it's interpreted or compiled further. And so the distinction between interpreted and compiled isn't always clear. Um, it, it can get a little bit blurred. Um, this is uh, the first high-level language right here. This is called Plan Call Cool, if I'm saying that right. And it was devised right smack in the middle of World War II. So it never really caught on. Um, but I was able to find this bit of code on a really cool um, Twitter uh, handle called Hello World Collection. It's down here. I am, as of last night, the 22nd follower. But they're pretty active, which, is, which really kind of blows my mind. They, they update it every, every couple few days. So check it out. They have Hello World written in a bunch of weird 
um, obscure languages. So, um, so then we're going to get into programming paradigm. Um, a programming paradigm is a way to classify his language by style. Um, languages fall into many, uh, 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 one language can work across these paradigms. It's not, uh, again, strict. Um, so imperative programming uses statements that change program state, and it describes how a program operates, and it's synonymous with procedural. And languages such as the C, C, C sharp, C++, Fortran, and COBOL are examples of this. Um, declarative programming uh, describes a problem rather than a solution, and it differs from imperative, and that imperative uses serial orders, and declarative's uh, sort of defining characteristics that it does not. Um, an example of this is SQL. And then functional programming, we've talked a bit about this. Um, it is inherently declarative. Um, it, uh, it uses pure functions that avoid changing the state. And its output is solely dependent on its input. And it's mainly just used in academia. There's not much commercial software being written in um, functional programs. But examples of those are Hope and Haskell. And then lastly, we come to object-oriented programming, which, uh, again, something that we kind of all know. Most popular languages today are object-oriented. But the main concept behind uh, object-oriented is that it uses objects which have fields that contain data, um, which are attributes, and then fields that also contain code, which are methods. And then a, a key feature of object-oriented is that methods can access and modify data within the objects. And the most popular ones are class-based, where, uh, where an object is an instance of a class. And of course, um, the, the popular ones are uh, C++, JavaScript, Python, um, Ruby, probably most of the ones you, you guys have heard on. So anyways, that's sort of a, a broad overview of the history and classifications of programming languages. There's a ton more, um, but uh, hopefully a little bit of the history and context will help you guys out going, going forward. So thank you.